Rock and Honor, Chemistry of Dr. Noor. Have no fear, Superman is here. Lesson one, learn entropy. Yes. Let's try to simplify things a bit. Basically, entropy is the heat content of a substance or a system. This heat is contained inside the substance and varies with different substances. A property such as entropy that depends on the nature of the substance of consideration and not its amount is called state function. The most common unit for measuring enthalpy is joules or kilojoules. Normally, enthalpy is represented by the symbol delta H. Lesson 2. Endothermic and Exothermic Reactions As we learned before, enthalpy is the amount of heat in an object. Basically, an exothermic reaction is when heat leaves the system to the surroundings. If this beaker were the system, the white space around it would be the surroundings. In terms of enthalpy, this is represented by a negative delta H value. On the other hand, an endothermic reaction occurs when the heat from the surroundings enters the system. As you've probably guessed, in terms of enthalpy, this would be a positive value. Some examples of exothermic and endothermic reactions in daily life are the use of hot packs and cold packs. A hot pack releases energy into the part of your body that it is in contact with. In contrast, a cold pack absorbs heat from your body and cools it down. Lesson 3 Finding Nemo Hey, that's not right. Finding Enthalpy There are three ways to find delta H. Number 1. Bond Dissociation Energy, or BDE Basically, BDE is the energy required to break a chemical bond. To use this method to find enthalpy, we have a cooking analog, a BDE recipe. In order to find the change in enthalpy for the reaction, HCl plus NaOH yields NaCl plus H2O, we need to think of the reaction separately. In one bowl, we have HCl, and in another, we have NaOH. In order to chop up these bonds, we need to add energy. In the bowl of HCl, we need about 431.8 kilojoules of energy. We all know that cooking would be quite unappetizing without spices like salt and pepper. In the same way, Reactants need energy in order to proceed to react with each other. In the bowl of NaOH, we similarly add about 685.0 kilojoules of energy. After adding the necessary amount of energy, the bond with the base element in the compound breaks. Here are the broken down compounds. For our beginner's lesson, we will assume that the reaction mechanism of this reaction goes directly from the reactant to the ions to the product. Now that we have broken all of the bonds in the reaction, we are ready to recombine the separate pieces as the final step for our recipe. Mix the ions together, and voila, we have our new product, NaCl, more commonly known as salt, and H2O, more commonly known as water. The new products are formed by the way of ions, forming new bonds with each other. As the bonds form, energy is released. In this problem, NaCl releases about 410 kilojoules of energy, and H2O releases about 856 kilojoules of energy. Now on to number two, Hess's Law. Sometimes you'll come across a reaction that can be formed through a series of reactions. If you know the delta H values for each step, you can find the delta H value for the ultimate reaction. By adding and subtracting the delta H values of each step like a big algebra equation. Say you want to make your admirer a homemade diamond. Sounds like that's realistic. Before you can start to use all the graph that you could possibly find in your house to make a diamond, you need to know how much energy will be absorbed or released to make this conversion possible. Let's start with the balance equation. You know the delta H values for using graphite and O2 to form CO2, and the value for diamond and O2 to create CO2. But how do you find the delta H value for creating that beautiful diamond ring from graphite? Well, it's just like I said before, a big addition problem. So, that means I could just add the two delta H values together, right? Because when you add the reactions together, you don't get graphite yielding diamond. You have to alter the equations first. See for equation 2, the diamond is on the wrong side. Using Hess's law, when you reverse reactions, you also reverse the sign. That makes the delta H value a positive 395.4 kilojoules. Now you can add them together. Cross out molecules that appear in both the reactants 
and product size. And you get graphite yielding diamonds. Now you can add the two delta H values together to find the solution. Positive 1.9 kilojoules. Number 3. Standard heat of formation. This is simple. The standard heat of formation is the change of enthalpy from the formation of one mole of the compound from its elements with all the substances in their standard state. Yeah, 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 none of you guys are going to remember that. To simplify this, it's how much energy it takes to form only one mole of a compound from just its elements. And these elements must be in the same form that we normally find them in nature. So like, how much energy it takes to form this. Or this. Or this. So, how do you use this to find the enthalpy of a reaction? All you gotta do is look up the values in the back of your annoyingly huge AP Chem textbook. For each substance, do the sum of the products minus the sum of the reaction. Let's do an example. Say Dr. Noor gives you this problem. To multiply the heat of formation for each compound by the reaction coefficient to find the total heat of formation for that particular compound. Finally, all there is left to do is plug our values into this formula. We add the values for the product and plug them in here. We do the same for the reaction and plug them in here. Now, solve the equation. We get delta H to be negative 1,396 kilojoules. Lesson 4 Knowing what heating curves are. Heating curves describe a relationship between temperature required to cause a phase change in a particular substance and the time required to do so. Such a relationship can be used to figure out how much the temperature of a substance needs to be for it to go into the next phase, as well as the amount of energy required to reach this point. As heat is added to the substance, the temperature increases and the heat is used to energize the molecules. This is the heat of fusion, or the amount of heat needed to go from solid to liquid or vice versa. This is the heat of vaporization, or the amount of heat needed to go from liquid to gas or vice versa. Notice there is no temperature change in these flat regions of the graph. This is because heat is used up in actually breaking the attractive forces between the molecules of the substance, and not to provide energy to the molecules. This concludes our crash course in thermal chemistry. We hope you learned a lot from this video. You'll surely ace your test on this unit. For further questions, please consult Taylor to assist with Katie out of sign of the question. If they're suffering from a serious case of senioritis, which they probably are, please call the Chemistry 101 Extraordinaire Dr. Noor at 1-800-555-8204. That's 1-800-555-8204.